Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Nikon Creators Hour. I'm your host, Mike Corrado. I've been with Nikon for over 35 years, working on 36, and I've been shooting for over 40 years. And during the time of the pandemic, we've created uh, this show called The Creators Hour, where we bring epic photographers to tell their stories about defining images. We have us with us today, uh, out of the DC area, Annapolis, Maryland, we have Mary F. Calvert. Mary, welcome to The Creators Hour. Hi, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you. So great to see you again, and one of the great pleasures for me in all of these interviews, and by the time we're done, we, you're part of 50 interviews that we've done for the Creator's Hour, uh, but this brings me back to memory lane just seeing you because we have a history of decades ago meeting. Um, I know your husband, Joe. Um, I, I can't wait to talk about your images because I know how powerful they are. I know how deep the stories are, too. So folks tuning in know that Mary and I are going to discuss some serious issues and serious stories that she has covered through her time. You've been a finalist for the Pulitzer. We've worked workshops together. You've got numerous World Press Awards. I mean, I'm going to brag on you all day long here um, because I love you that much. But uh, it's so good to see you. But I, I, I definitely want to know right out of the gate, how are you and Joe doing? And what have you been doing for the past few months? Joe and I are fine. We're at home a lot. We're, we're trying to be really careful. Um, it's, it's been just such a weird, weird time. My family's safe. Um, my Joe's family's safe. We're just trying to get through it, you know? Just is there anything, I'm sorry, is there anything you've done during this time in the way of creativity or have you backed off uh, shooting? Are you shooting, you know, different stories during this time? Well, I've backed off a lot of shooting. Um, I've, it, it's just really hard to get. I have asthma. Joe has asthma. So we're trying to be especially careful. Um, what I have been doing is going through old pictures. Like I've got t hundreds and hundreds of CDs filled with pictures. And so I'm starting to move those over onto hard drives. So I have some stuff and I'm working on an update on my website. So I've been doing a lot of that and... Um, just trying to organize all the things I don't usually have time to do. It's amazing you talk about going through old CDs, and I, I've seen and done the same thing, and it's like a weird thing to me. Do you remember at the time you were moving the images to the CD, and you thought, oh, that's the way we're going to be storing images, and then right. it turns into the hard drives, and then it turns into you know, all these devices. I've got jazz drives, zip drives. I mean, through the history of our career in digital <laughs> images on just about any device we have. So as soon as you said CDs, I'm thinking about all these books I have of CDs that, like yeah. you said, it's a great time to be able to transition over. When you're looking at the photos are you finding anything that you didn't even think back then had relevance but now has relevance I mean, or does it bring you down memory lane well it does bring me down memory lane and one of the one of the things that pops up first is how small some of those early digital images were yeah, Shockingly small. yeah. <laughs> and um you know looking at a an old flash card that's 256 56 megabytes it's just mind-boggling but I, I have noticed, um, I did a lot of travel. I photographed the White House a lot in the early 2000s. And so just looking back at that, looking back at the history that's there of what was going on then, you know, various trips to Afghanistan, um, Congo, uh, Nigeria, all of, you know, Pakistan, all these different places. So it's been really interesting to look through that stuff. Well, that's awesome. And, and again, I, I feel like I feel you because I feel like that walk down memory lane and finding images and saying, wow, that image looks so much better to me than it did when I was actually editing the first round. Um, and, and it's great. But you talked about going back. Take us back to when you first started here. I want to know that I, I, I want to be there when Mary Nugent picked up a camera. <laughs> Mary Nugent. Mary Calvert picked up a camera. We have a person here that works Mary Nugent. So I, I've been saying Mary Calvert all day long, but I love Mary Nugent too. Scratch Mary Nugent. Uh, Mary Calvert picks up a camera for the first time. Well, I was always very artistic. And when I was growing up, there was a lot of upheaval in the United States. It was the years of um, Robert Kennedy being murdered, Martin Luther King being murdered, uh, the Vietnam War, all of this social unrest. And I, I was interested in that too. You couldn't help but be interested, not being, you know. Um, and so because I was artistic, I did various artistic expression of, of my 
impressions of that time. And then one day my mother let me use her Agfa rangefinder. Now I had been shooting with little cameras, you know, those little plastic Dianas and all that stuff, the little Kodak ones. Mm -hmm. And my dad had um, some cameras too. He taught me how to develop film in the kitchen sink when I was about 11. And uh, so I think, I think I got the bug from him because when he was a soldier in Korea, he did a lot of, photography and he won some contests and so he had a love of it and he passed that on to me and so I started taking pictures I thought oh this is great I'm good and then I realized looking back it was just crap but it was enough to make me interested because I could show what real life was like and so I started going to college and I I was a fine art photographer in the beginning uh, which was was really fun. I would go out in the middle of the night and do all these night pictures in Georgetown and parts of DC that a young woman probably shouldn't be walking around at night under railroad tracks and all this other stuff. But um, I really loved that. But then I started to realize that I was never going to be able to make a living making those pictures. And so I became a commercial photography major. And that went on but it was a lot of studio stuff. It was very, very dry. And I went back to fine art. And so one day I was out at the movies with my mother and it turns out that Ronald Reagan had been shot that day. And we were at a movie theater just down the street from where they brought him at, to George Washington University Hospital. And so I grabbed my cameras and I went and I hung out with the other news photographers, the White House press corps in front of that hospital. And within four hours, I'd found my calling. And I must also note that, that when I started going to college, I started going to community college and I had lots of different majors. I was a mental health major. I was a travel and tourism major. And I just kept moving from one thing to the next. And finally, in that four hour period in front of that hospital, I realized that photojournalism was the best parts of all those different majors. And from there, I never looked back. And so just kept making pictures, started to learn more about ethics and captions and um, how to talk to people because it's all about the people in this business. You know, I was, I was gonna say that's so important because you do have to connect with subjects uh, to get their names after. And uh, yeah, that, uh, you love telling the story. Talk to me about the depth and the emotion of how important it is for you to tell the story and tell it accurately? Well, I think that you would do a disservice to the people you're photographing not to be absolutely accurate and absolutely honest with them about the whole process of what it means to have the photographer come and tell your story. Um, it's with most of the projects I'm working on, I'm dealing with very, very traumatized people who have been um, retaliated against, have been um, shunned by their peers. Um, people don't believe them when they say what happened to them. And so it's really important for me to tell their story with integrity on my part and their dignity always intact. And so that's always the thing that's running through my head because none of this is about me. I'm just the, you know, the person who's bearing witness. It's all about them. And it, I'm so conscious of that because more important than anything we do is fidelity to our subjects. And so I'm, I'm really proud of calling myself a photojournalist because the journalism part is so important to, to, to become, to be a photojournalist, you have to have both parts of that equation. Um, it, it's just so important to do the research, to find out who people are, find out what the issue is, who's helping, who's hurting. All of those things add up to a set of pictures that really has far more meaning and is far more impactful. And we're going to get to see 10 images of the body of work that you do. 
Um, the reason why I introduced you is Mary F. Calvert again, www.maryfcalvert is uh, your website, and that is just the same for your Instagram handle. Um, so those of you that are invited into uh, um, Mary's account on Instagram, you'll see some fabulous work, but her, uh, her webpage has it all. So we're, we're kind of limiting you to 10 within this body of work that you have, so I apologize for that. And I apologize for it because I've gotten a lot of guff from many of the interviewees to have to call down the work was a really difficult task. Uh, but even more important, though, the positive of that, as I said, it was actually great therapy. What was it like to have to cull down these images we're about to see? Well, it was, it was not easy because I've done so many different things in, in my career as a, as a photojournalist. And I wanted to have a mix of some lighter moments because I knew that there were going to be some very heavy, intense pictures. And so I was trying to have a balance of that. And... Um, you know, every story, it, people say, well, what's your favorite story? And I say, well, they're, they're all, it's like my children. I can't choose my favorite child. They, um, they're all special to me in their own way. So I was just trying to put together a variety. And that, that was, you know, it started with a pretty big folder of pictures. And then I was just calling down, calling down and trying to be tough with myself. So Mm -hmm. Well, I can't wait to hear the stories about these. And as we pull the pictures up, by all means, um, please tell us everything about why you selected this image. What does it mean to you? What did it mean to you at that time? What does it mean to you now? It's obviously still important, but uh, this is your time now. Talk about this image and give us some of the backstory to what it's about. Okay. So uh, one day I was at my computer and I received an email saying, greetings from the kingdom of Bhutan. Now, I know most of us would just hit delete, but I opened it and I thought, well, this is intriguing. And it was a man from the Ministry of Communication, and he was looking for a photographer to come to Bhutan, which is a tiny little country in the Himalayas between Nepal and Tibet. And he wanted somebody to come and teach photography, teach photojournalism photography to the local photographers. And so I showed I showed the message to Joe. I said, Joe, what do you think? And he said, write him back. And so I wrote him back. And um, pretty soon I found myself on a plane to Bhutan. And I got there and it's the most lovely, beautiful, incredible country. And it's, uh, they have a gross national happiness index. A certain, a large percentage, something like 63% of the country has to be forest. And they have so many monks. There are more monks and nuns supported by the government than there are a total of troops, police, and palace guards. And so uh, it, 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 Buddhism is so important. And so when I got there, I had 16 students. And we had some classroom work. I gave them some tutorials and what's a feature picture, what's a news picture, what's a portrait, that sort of thing. And I made sure that every day we would go out and shoot because there's, you can't teach all of that. You can't teach most of that in a classroom, how to, how to shoot pictures. And so we went out and these guys were so great. They took me to all these amazing monasteries and I would just give them their assignment for the day and then send, cut them loose. And um, so I was wandering around by myself and this is in Punica and I'm just standing there looking at this amazing door. Everything in that country is decorated. And this monk comes up and right before he stepped over the threshold into the courtyard, he kind of flipped his, his um, robes up. And it was, you know, I hit the button and you're thinking, oh God, did I get that? Did I get that? And so I was, I was really happy that I was able to make this picture. It was just a, a beautiful moment. And it, and it just symbolizes what a fantastic trip that was. And it, I always will remember all the people I met there when I see this picture. And I think that's a great way to open this up and start because when a picture certainly pleases the viewers that you're intending it to, to, to have them see, uh, have them see it. When you draw back on that important moment and how it made you feel, you know, I love that about a photo, you know, and, um, and certainly makes it even that much more important. Talk to me about teaching because, you, you know, you've done a ton of workshops. In fact, that's a place that you and I have met. And if I said to you, good Ken and bad Ken, what would that mean to you? 
Um, but uh, talk about the importance of teaching and what does good can and bad can mean? We're calling them out right here, right now. Okay, so good can and bad can. You can decide for yourself who's good and who's bad. But we're talking mm -hmm. about Ken Cook, who was my boss when I was an intern in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and Ken Hackman, who uh, ran the Department of Defense workshop for military photographers uh, with Ken. And yeah. I, I owe so much to these men. They, they've taught me so many things about what it means to give back, to have all this knowledge that people have been generous with me as I came up in my career and how important it is to turn around and pass it around. Because if, if you don't give away, give it away, you can't keep it. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, we talk about two guys, uh, Ken Hackman, who started Air Force Photojournalism and Combat Camera, and Ken Cook from Carolina. I always used to complain it took him two hours to get to the workshop uh, <laughs> that we did together, which is a place we met, the Worldwide Military Workshop in Pensacola. So um, thank you uh, for sharing that. And I think that's so important, education and mentors. And, um, and we're both... Uh, we both have been inspired by the both Kens, and there really isn't a bad Ken. Maybe it's a given day, but um, I love that. And thank you for opening up with this picture. I saw, I saw the group of these, and I just love them all. But this one, I just love this moment. Talk about what's going on here. Well, I used to cover the Naval Academy graduation every year. And usually I was, my newspaper would send me, and I would be the only photographer there. And so I had to... I had to get the cover my ass pictures and make sure that my coverage was complete. And so, you know, it's, it's hard to get really creative outside the box when you can't fail. But the day I shot this picture, they sent two photographers for my newspaper. There was a young guy who had never shot the graduation and he wanted the experience. I said, okay. I said, well, you're going to need this picture and this picture and this picture. And so I kind of helped him figure out where to go. And because I had him there, I could just, you know, go and screw up if I could, which means I was going to try something different, which may or may not work. And that, that's what you mean by cover your ass, by the way, right? The ass. editors are wanting you to turn in certain pictures or specific right. types of pictures. The cover your ass, you get those out of the way, you get to do more. So this, essentially, this guy's covering your ass. Right. And so normally when the Blue Angels do their flyover, the editors always like the picture from the back so that you could see all the graduates, a sea of graduates, you could see the stage, and then you could see the planes coming over. But because Michael was there making that picture, I... I just snuck up to the front and got down, crouched down below the grads. And when those planes came over, I made this picture. And um, I later found out that some of my friends said, why is she going up there? What is she doing? And so I was really happy to, to get something that I had not seen before from that graduation. So um, it was a really exciting moment. And I don't think they fly that low anymore but they were really low. So that was a, they, that was a fun picture to make. The ceiling looks a little low too, you know, yeah, meaning the, the clouds low. like a cloudy day. So, but this is an epic picture because it is not one that you typically see. I was fortunate enough to cover, fortunate enough to cover a West Point graduation. Talk about the intensity of that graduation. I yeah. mean, it's just so much pomp and circumstance and so much uh, history and legacy and, you know, tradition in, in an event like that. And the one I covered, uh, President Carter happened to show at, up at at West Point. But what's the talk about the excitement and intensity in an event like this with the Blue Angels flying over? Well, it's, uh, there is so much theater in these graduations, especially the Naval Academy. I actually have not photographed the West Point um, or the, the Air Force Academy graduation. But because I live in Annapolis, it's kind of practically right in my backyard. And so there are things that happen. They have the parade of, of midshipmen coming into the stadium. They have different speeches. They have the graduates um, who are sitting there, some falling asleep, some every, every time, every year somebody passes out because it's so hot. And... Um, and then when these Blue Angels come over, they're basically the start of the whole thing once everybody gets in there and sits down. And it's something that happens in 
just a couple of seconds. I mean, they fly in, and if you're not ready, and you, you don't have your camera pointed up and a really fast shutter speed, you could miss it like that. So uh, it, it, it's a great sense of accomplishment when you make certain pictures. It's almost like a rite of passage I found with photographers. You know, you have to get a good when they're tossing their hats up. You have to get a good picture then. You have to, you know, th there are just so many little gets from um, an assignment like this. And on assignment, are you typically going out with the same lenses, zoom or prime? Talk a little bit about the focal length choices for you while you're, while you're covering an assignment like this. Well, I usually have my um, short zoom on one camera. I have my 70 to 200 on the other camera, and that covers about 95% of what I photograph. And then with something like this, you need a little bit longer lens so that you can get the speeches, you can get the president speaking, and people getting their diplomas, that sort of thing. You kind of want a longer lens for that, depending on where they let you stand. Because part of it is negotiating what your access is going to be and where you can be. And we, we, we can't just wander around willy nilly. We have very specific guidelines. Um, actually, they're not even guidelines, they're rules when you mm -hmm. photograph something like this, especially if the president is going to be there, then everything really tightens up a lot. Beautiful. You, you have a front row seat to history. Um, yeah. And, and it's pretty clear in this photo. What's going on here? Uh, I, obviously, we can see presidents and former presidents, yes. but uh, talk about this moment for you. It was, uh, I covered George Bush for, I think, nine years, a little bit when he was governor of Texas and through the campaign, two different campaigns. And so I was there every day. And one day, and I can't remember why, but the other four presidents came and they had a photo op. And it was, it was such a great moment. And when we go in the Oval Office, they only give us about, usually it's about seven seconds. And we've timed this, especially when they're sitting in the chairs by the fireplace when the, when the president has a head of state in town. And they're sitting in the chairs by the fireplace and they bring all of us in and uh, they look at each other, they shake hands, and then you get a couple of seconds more and then they say thank you very much which means it's time to leave and so it's a skill that that is is very very special that i was forced to learn by covering the white house that has really came in handy many many times later on in my career where i had to get in and get out and make a, a usable picture and so i look at this picture and i think look at these guys and, and we have Democrats, we have Republicans, and there was just a camaraderie which, which was so thick in the air in, in the room that day. It was, it was just a great, great moment seeing these men who had um, done so much in their administration, some good, some bad, but it, it, was, it was an amazing experience to be there for that. And take us off a little bit on what you were describing before. You're not walking in there alone this time, unlike the graduation. Okay. You're not the only photographer. Describe what we don't see here and okay. where you are. You've got a center spot. That's a good spot to grab. But right. what else is going on around you? Well, usually, and this is it, it's probably a little different now. I haven't covered this administration as much. But back in those days in the Bush administration, we would be waiting in the briefing room area. We, we have our desks and then they say, um, please meet at the briefing room doors. And so we would go and wait and we're all standing there and it's a whole bunch of photographers. It's probably 14 photographers. And um, there's always the core group of the wires and then the local papers. And um, usually we, we vie for the center spot uh, depending on what, what the event is. And so then they take us out and then we wait on the colonnade outside the cabinet room. And then finally somebody opens up the door to the Oval Office and they wave us in. And so we all run in and we were jockeying for position. And, and luckily everybody in the White House press corps is, is absolutely wonderful. It's a very tight group. We actually really look after each other even though we're all in competition. And then you just go in and we know where we can be. And sometimes it might be a little bit longer photo op if they bring 
uh, cameras in to do a couple of questions. And then you actually have opportunity to move around a little bit more. But this is one of those situations where we ran in, made pictures, um, you maybe had a little bit of time to get up and try to get it from the side, and then we're being shuffled out. And uh, it, it's, it's a wild scene, let me tell you. And it's high pressure, like you say, you got to make that shot, you know? Well, and yeah. there, I mean, and no excuses. Me, there's an absolute wall of people. <laughs> and I love this shot because in a way, when you see that shot and everybody's pose so formal, beautiful, that's the go-to shot. That's the one you cover your ass with. But I love the fact that there are laughs on the end and there's a connection. It humanizes the presidents Absolutely. here. And, and so important to realize <laughs> these, these people are people. Uh, and uh, I mean, it may sound obvious, but, um, you know, just again, a beautiful moment. Um, let's get serious about some of the stories you tell. What's happening here? I, uh, back in, I can't remember, 2011, I went to Nigeria, northern Nigeria, with a friend of mine who I used to work with. Uh, she's a reporter, and she was, she had a grant to a fellowship to work on a project about polio. And the story was that uh, between the Gates Foundation, Rotary Club, World Health Organization, they had almost eradicated polio. I mean, it was almost going to be like smallpox. And they were really looking for victory down the road. And then in the Muslim North, some clerics um, heard a rumor. There was a rumor going around that the polio vaccine that was being brought out to give to their children was a Western plot to, to sterilize their children and give them HIV. And so they banned the vaccine. And when that happened, and they were down to about three countries where there was still polio, only three countries. And after that happened, after they banned the vaccine, over 3,000 children were infected with polio because polio is a disease, is a virus that kills, cripples those it does not kill. And so during that time, a bunch of new infections happened and then over 20 countries were reinfected with polio. That, um, that is under control once again, but then it was really hard. And, and we, were, we were out with some people doing vaccinations one day, and then another day there were some people in this town that they wanted us to meet. And we went over to the home of this boy who had contracted polio during the vaccine ban. And when I was at the compound in the, in the, the house, there's kind of a, an outdoor courtyard and the child was there and he was moving around and I looked down because I was making pictures looking down and I realized, oh my God, that's his mother's footprint because his mother was just walking off. I could see her making these footprints. I thought to me, it was so symbolic. Uh, I like metaphor in pictures and it was so symbolic that, that he will never make a footprint, that this is his future. And um, it was it's an intense moment when you see something like that and you think it, it all comes to life for you. And this actually was, this was not an assignment. I had a friend doing the story. And so I kind of tagged along and made the pictures and then got it published. Um, but it was, it, it was a heartbreaking story. And I'm really glad that I'm hoping anyway, that things have gotten better. So it's, it's a very volatile region. Um, so people there are just fighting this, this awful affliction of polio with um, not great medical care, not very many treatments. And um, so it, it's a really awful thing. But now that the, the vaccine was actually, the ban went stopped and, and people are getting vaccinated again. But there's still a lot of mistrust for it. I was in neighborhoods where I, I photographed um, children and families and the parents had polio the children had polio and and witnessing these people who were crippled every day in this one neighborhood did not still didn't inspire people to go in and, and get their children vaccinated it was really really hard hard to see that it's it's amazing and it's making me reflect on everything we're going through right now 
um, yeah. to realize it's even more difficult, you know, with other cultures in different parts of the world. That significance of the footprint, though, I mean, that's just a beautiful, I mean, what a beautiful thing. And as you say, to realize that that's the mom's footprint and that young person is not going to have that footprint in life, um, that's, that's very, very touching, very, very powerful. Um, obviously, the emotion there catches you. How do you. How do you deal with that when you come home? Well, when I'm traveling with a reporter, especially this particular reporter, we would, would every night at dinner, we talk about what we saw, uh, what we heard, what we smelled. Um, we, we talk it all out. And so it's never something that we allow to fester. And, you know, the story that we're going to talk about in a little while, the military project, you know, that's, that's really difficult. Um, it's, you can't unsee things. And I always tell myself, people say, well, how do you handle this? How do you get through it? And it's like, well, I get to go in for a few hours and then I get to leave. And I tell myself, you got to suck it up because this is someone's life. You know, you are going in there to bear witness and tell the world what is happening. Um, and so you have to just find your strength, buck up and do your job. That's the most thing, important thing is to do the job so that you can give people without a voice a platform. Amazing, beautiful. Let's keep rolling here. Another beautiful, powerful image. What's happening here? Well, they, in certain neighborhoods, they had a kind of mobile vaccine center set up where kids would come and, and get the drops. And then afterward, they would give them a bar of soap and a couple of pieces of candy. And the kids would enjoy the candy and take the soap home to their moms. And then their moms would a lot, a lot of times say, oh, well, how about that? And then they would send the other kids to get vaccinated. And they were only doing kids who were at least five years old. The problem was is that uh, not everybody knew exactly how old they were. And I discovered that if you can do this, if you can touch your ear, that means you're five and up. So that was interesting, learning these little things. And um, these little boys were so dear and they were nervous and they were just really holding on to each other. Um, giving each other strength to get this done. So this was, it was an amazing, amazing thing to witness. These really compassionate men who were distributing the drops and, and keeping a record of who was getting vaccinated, where, you know, how many people on what days to, to really make a positive impact in the community. Beautiful, beautiful, amazing, amazing story. Where are we here? What's happening? Okay. This is the start of the body of work that I've been working on since 2013. And I actually had been laid off from my job um, a couple of years before. And so I no longer had the institution of a newspaper behind me to, to fund these out of town trips to tell stories. And so I started to look for something that I could, um, something near me that wouldn't cost me much money. And my husband, Joe Eddins, had said, you know, you should be looking at military sexual trauma because it's a terrible problem and nobody's doing anything about it. And so I started to do my research. And I read the Department of Defense numbers from the previous year. They do a report every two years. And the year that I started working on this, there was an estimated 26,000 sexual assaults in the U.S. military. And that just blew my mind. You know, I've been working with the military photographers for so many years. And so I've been walking up and down the halls of various bases. And I used to see these posters talking about military sexual trauma. And there were hotline numbers and places to get assistance. And I really honestly looked at those and thought, why on earth do they need that here? Surely that's not happening. So when I saw that it was, I was so shocked. And then I had to figure out how I was going to tell the story. And so there were some hearings on Capitol Hill in DC and where were survivors um, 
of sexual assault were coming to Capitol Hill to speak to our lawmakers. And so I went to this hearing and I'm standing there and I'm making pictures and in, um, at the table, Jen Norris, who was in the Air Force, was telling the story of how she was sexually assaulted uh, when she had enlisted in the Air Force and she, she went to a party at her recruiter's house. He said it was a new recruits party. And while she was there, he drugged her and sexually assaulted her. And then she ended up continuing into the Air Force and she had more problems down the line from various commanders and, um, and instructors. And so here she is telling this story and I'm standing there and I'm looking at this room and I'm thinking, my God, I've been in this room probably hundreds of times over the years. And when the baseball players came to talk about steroid use, this room was absolutely packed. And I stood there that day and I looked at this room where so many people didn't bother to show up. And to this day, it gives me chills. And I looked at that and I thought, this is insane. This is what is happening here. And so that really cemented my resolve to tell this story. And so then I started to make more contacts with people and go to their homes. That's phenomenal. And that comparison about, you know, who shows up for baseball and steroids and as compared to this story, you mentioned before that you don't have the, you know, you, you, you were laid off from the newspaper. You don't have the institution behind you, right? How yeah. are you getting credentialed to get into these places or this access? Is it your history there working and people knowing you or the network that you, you know, serve within? Uh, how, how are you getting the access to tell the story? Well, because I've covered Capitol Hill for so long, I have a freelancer credential. And usually that entails getting some kind of letter from, from organizations, news organizations that you frequently work for. And so I'm credentialed to cover Capitol Hill and the White House. So um, because if you're working in D.C., you have to do that stuff. So, mm -hmm. so that's how I got that access. Gotcha. Amazing. Uh, great start uh, to this story. Uh, what's happened? Beautiful picture again. Very, very telling. But you tell the story here. What's up? Well, I had been um, traveling a, just a day's drive from my house when I started this project because I didn't have anybody interested in, in the story. And I just thought it was so important. So many people were, were being hurt by this issue. And so I started to apply for grants and I, I got the I was awarded the Alexia Foundation Women's Initiative Grant. And so then I was able to start traveling. And I had gone to San Diego where I met some, some young Navy women. And one day they, they had organized this action where they took shower curtain liners and they wrote their stories of what happened to them on the liner. And then under cover of darkness, they went up to the footbridge right across from the entrance to Naval Station San Diego, and they hung them on the bridge. And when we first got there, the, the ladies were holding up their shower curtain and their friends, their colleagues were, were over here photographing them. And so I was standing off to the side and, and again, I saw this and it was just like, it looks like she's on a crucifix and it, it, it just blew my mind. And so, that, so these, these shower curtains, they were only up overnight. But um, it, was, it was such an amazing thing for them to go out there and write down on this, this piece of plastic the most terrific, awful thing that ever happened to them, that these women had this amazing courage and drive to, to get past this trauma, to learn to live with this trauma, and to seek justice. And so many of them are still trying to find justice. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting to me that when I show these pictures, people are so horrified and it, it at least helps to open up a conversation because people are interested in talking about war and talking about all these other difficult things, disease, um, um, awful things that are happening to people in this world, but, but sexual assault is still kind of, it's a taboo thing. 
And so um, it's hard for people to talk about and it's hard for people to see these pictures. And so I'm so grateful for these organizations that have, have published these pictures. And I've actually showed these pictures in presentations on several military bases and nobody has ever stopped me from showing them. Which, which I'm really grateful for. And I know the people who are in the photographs are really grateful too. Because I just, they, we cannot forget these people. And if writers and photographers have a skill that can help get the story out, it's really, really important. And I consider that my career is not successful unless it advances the story that needs to be told. Absolutely. Big, important story. You talk with Joe, you come up with this idea, you get it going, you kick the momentum in to, to build a story. Talk about emotionally how, you know, now all of a sudden, I guess your adrenaline's pumping because the more story you tell, I would think the more you want to dig in to go even deeper. But um, you mentioned, I was going to ask you, the, the sensitivities and challenges, talk about those. Because you went on base and you showed these in military establishments, you would think they wouldn't want you to do that. What are some of the other challenges you face along the way? Well, it's um, I've learned so much about talking with people about what we're doing. And I knew that everybody in these pictures was going to see themselves. And I knew that I had to make really sensitive pictures because if I, I had to show what their lives look like, what does this kind of trauma do to a person? And so when they showed interest in being part of the project, I sat down with them either on the phone or in person if possible. And I talked to them about what I was trying to do and how in, as a photojournalist, I have to show. And so I said, there are going to be times where you're going to be really upset and something's happening and I'm going to have to be making pictures. And so, so they knew that this was coming, that, that when I was at their house, if they were crying or if they were angry or, or if something was happening um, that had to do with their trauma, then I was going to be making pictures. And all of them signed model releases. Um, we talked about where these were going to be published and who was going to see them and, and I think probably 99% of the people I talked to said yes. They said yes. They said people need to know that this is happening. And so it's – people talk to me about, you know, I've won awards, which is great. I think it's great. Um, there's something useful about that. But it's not about the awards, People say, well, how can I achieve this? Like, well, it's not about winning prizes and winning grants. It's about the people you're photographing. You know, this, when I go into somebody's life like this, I have to show them respect. I have to, to be kind. I have to show compassion. And I think you cannot really put that stuff on. You really have to feel that stuff. And remember, you never, never can forget that this is somebody's life. This is somebody who has opened up their life to you who is bearing witness to show this to the world. And if you don't respect that, then you probably shouldn't be in this business. Mm -hmm. I would say it's probably more of a privilege to be there and a blessing to be there. But it goes back to what you were saying before. When you tell them this is what you need to do, that's part of that mission that you mentioned to tell that story accurately and to give them a voice and to create awareness uh, with all this. And uh, is there ever a point where you say to yourself, I'm not going to take this picture um, or uh, shoot it and then say um, you decide whether you will show that picture or not? Well, I usually make the picture and then, um, and then decide later. I mean, there was, for an example, I took a photograph of a woman who was, had a serious drinking issue and I took a picture of her in um, a veterans hall and she, she didn't look good. And I thought if I use this picture, it's going to be a cheap shot. And I I don't want it to be a cheap shot. I want them to have their dignity intact. You can take meaningful pictures 
with your subject's dig dignity intact. And I think that's part of, of the integrity that you have to have to do this stuff. Yep. Well, dignity, yeah. Dignity is the word. Yep. It really is. It really is. Um, cause I, I, every time somebody invites me into their life to tell me these kinds of things that have happened to them, I, I have a, I'm, it's very, very humbling. It's very, very humbling. And I know that I have to do right by them as a human being, because I'm a human first, you know, I'm a, um, citizen of of the planet and we're we're all in this together whether or not people want to really um believe that or act on that and so um i th i just think that's really important it is and telling these stories is very important because like you said everything else going on in the world who's focusing on this you know particular subject so thank you for doing that for us um let's continue on we've got three more pictures to show Okay. Um, what's happening here? This is uh, Melissa Ramon. And after I started working on the project about the women, I um, wanted to go deeper into the story. And I do a ton of research. And while I was doing research, I found out that homeless women veterans are the fastest growing group of veteran homeless people in the U.S. And if you're a homeless woman veteran, then there's a... a a large possibility that you have been a victim of sexual assault in the military. And so I started um, approaching these organizations that, that supposedly looked after veterans who were homeless. And I kept getting the door slammed in my face and nobody would give me access to their clients, which was really sad. Um, because at this point, I think I had become somewhat of a trusted journalism journalist in that community. And I, I just thought it was sad that they weren't allowing their adult clients to make their own decision of whether or not they wanted to be part of the project. And so I, I knew that I had to find somebody who was gonna let me photograph them. And so I discovered these veteran stand downs where uh, stand down is a term from the Vietnam era where, where soldiers would come in from the field and replenish with a hot meal, medical care, um, clean clothes um, and various services. And so different organizations like um, Veterans Village in San Diego or Goodwill will put on these events where homeless veterans come and they have um, all kinds of, of services from uh, medical service, a mental health service, um, um, attorneys, uh, they give them meals, they give them clothes, they give them all this stuff so they can come and try to, to find a way to, to, to um, get out of this cycle of homelessness that they've been in since they left the military. And so um, while I was there, I met Melissa. And one of the things I started to realize as I was doing the project about the homeless veterans was that homelessness in this particular community doesn't look like we think it's gonna look. It's not somebody standing on a corner with all their belongings. Because so many of these women are so traumatized and they get so triggered by being around other people, crowds, men, um, enclosed spaces even, that they'll do anything to not end up in a shelter. And veterans who have children like Melissa have a whole different set of circumstances they're dealing with. Because for instance, Melissa had had at the time her son was 13 and he was in a uh, junior high that he was thriving in. And when she was trying to get housing, she was told that she had to go to a shelter, but most shelters won't take a male child over the age of 12. And so they said, you have to send your son to the male side. And she said, no way. And then the other choice was, well, there's another shelter that you can be with your son, but then he's going to have to change schools. And so she didn't she knew that this is a 13 year old young man who's on the cusp of, of, of a very precarious time, his teen years. And so she didn't want to change that. And so she would just go to these awful hotels, these kind of resident hotels, and she moved from hotel to hotel. And when I made this picture, she was telling me this whole story. And she has this tattoo and I asked her what 
the tattoo was about. And she said it symbolized the cover-ups and the corruption and um, the so-called nonprofits that were trying to help her, but she could never seem to get a leg up. And, and so it was, it was a very moving interview to be part of. Um, again, I mean, here's a person who, who, who wanted their story told so, so badly they felt the world really needed to know. And so they're trusting another person to accurately tell their story. And that's why it's so important to do research and to talk to people and to know their story so that you can, you can write an accurate caption because their stories mean something. The stories here are very, very important. And so that's where you really have to emphasize the journalism part of photojournalism to have I, I a think, complete picture. Yeah, I think what you say, the research is so important. The compassion you mentioned is so important and um, you've captured it so beautifully. Um, talk about this image. Well, when the first parts of this project of the women started to get published and people started to leave comments and notes um, online, and I started to hear from men, male veterans, and they were saying things like, we constitute 52% of the cases. When are you going to do something on us? And so this, this chapter kind of found me, and um, the numbers were awful for the men, too. I mean, it was, it was, you know, thousands and thousands of male victims and and a lot of these guys wait 20 to 40 years to tell anybody what happened to them. Most of them don't report the crime. Um, and they're suffering from a different kind of PTSD than combat PTSD. And there weren't, there just aren't a lot of services for these guys. There are very few inpatient beds. And a lot of times these guys are tossed in with combat uh, PTSD veterans. Um, and it's just, it's just a different thing for the guys. And so, I, I met Ethan. Now, Ethan was in the Marine Corps, and he's a victim of male hazing. And, you know, it's, it's one of the most common forms of sexual assault in the military, but it's also the least understood. And so it was a hazing exercise, and these are meant to humiliate these young troops and intimidate them. And so Ethan, I went to see him, and he was telling me how – he was, they were out um, doing the obstacle course one day and they came in and these are young, these are like teenagers and they're in the shower and they're horsing around, they're laughing and talking and the drill instructor came in and told them to be quiet and they kind of quieted down and then they got going again. And the third time he came in, he made them all line up buttocks to genitals in a tight pack and walk from one side of the shower room to the other. And this went on for over an hour. And uh, Ethan, after that, a lot of the guys were really, really freaked out by it. And Ethan started to have panic attacks. And even though he and some of the other guys of the other recruits actually reported the incident and the instructor was removed, he still um, started to have nightmares and, and panic attacks, and he was unable to hold a job. He would get really triggered around water. And so he's telling me this and how he cannot take showers. And so I, I hung out with him for a few days, and then I went home, and I'm on the plane home, and I think to myself, oh, my goodness, I should have gotten a picture of him bathing. And... Oh, so I went home and, and this kind of festered around in my brain for about two years. And finally, one day I just called him up and I said, Ethan, it's really important for me to show what your life is like from this trauma. And I think it's really important for me to, to show you when you're bathing. And I said, I don't want you to do anything for me. I just like to be there when it happens. So he said, okay, let me talk to my wife. And he got back to me and she said, yes. And he said, come on out. And so I went out to Austin, Minnesota. And um, I was really shocked at the progression of this trauma. This was two years later when I saw him again. And he had put on a lot of weight. 
and he was spending his day in front of the TV drinking whiskey and um, and he said he said this is when I take my bath you can be there and um, I said okay and so went downstairs and he's in the bathroom and I don't need a picture of him naked that's that's to me that was crossing a line and so he got in the tub and he said you can come in now so I went in and it was the most intense process he put about an inch and a half of water in the tub and he had a cup and he was kind of splashing himself with water soaping up a little bit the whole time making these moans and he, it, it, it looked like he, he kind of left his body even for a minute, you know, it was so intense. And this whole thing lasted about 90 seconds. And, you know, when you're a photographer in there making these pictures, it's, it's hard to kind of keep your hands from shaking because it's such a profound, um, it's, it's profound in so many ways. I mean, this person has the courage to allow you in and you have to have so much respect to, to tell this part of the story. And um, it became one of the most important pictures in the project because I, th I think it really showed how this sexual assault is something that is with a person, a victim, a survivor, every single minute of every single day. And so I think it really helped to tell the story, to make people stop and, and, and listen to the story, see the picture and start to understand what it's like to have this happen to you and to be thrown away by the organization that you wanted to join your whole life. And, um, so it was, it was very, very intense. And I'll always thank Ethan for allowing us into his life. It's amazing relationships you seem to have formed along the way um, as you go. We have this one last image. This has been very powerful. Thank you so much You're welcome. Uh, Mary, for sharing these stories because the insight is incredible. Uh, what's happening here in this photo? This is Paul. And Paul was sexually assaulted um, in the showers one night when he was in the military. And I'd spent probably five or six days with him and his wife. And he called me out of the blue. Uh, I meet a lot of the people I photograph who contact me. And I get emails. I get phone calls. I get phone calls from parents um, and and from veterans, and, and Paul had called me to tell me what had happened to him, and he said, yes, you can come to the house, and so I was there, and it's very intense when you're staying with somebody. It's, it's very intense, and you're always on because everything, everything that happens around you is so important, and so you have to be hyper alert, and so one day um, they said, well, we're going to go to the store to pick up some groceries, and I said, okay, so I'm, I'm in the car, I'm in the back of the car with them, and I'm thinking, I'm so tired, maybe I'll just wait in the car and play my game on the phone. But the little voice in my head, which sounds a lot like my husband's voice, said, you need to push on. You need to push through whatever's keeping you from going in that store. So I went in, and they were shopping, and Ethan broke off um, – to look for some light bulbs. And while he was in the light bulb aisle, the, the candle section is right next to light bulbs. And so he started popping caps of candles and smelling them. And all of a sudden, he kind of wavered and he sank to the floor and he's crying. And I find out later that the candle he smelled smelled like the shampoo he was using when he was sexually assaulted. And, uh, you know, I had been with him and his wife for several days at this point, like I said, and so they, they were used to the camera. And I just kind of backed off down the aisle and I made a few frames and, you know, I still didn't machine gun it. I, I was trying to be thoughtful and unobtrusive. 
and um you know and and you you feel weird when you're making these pictures and and even afterward i said i said i'm so sorry i had to make pictures of that and he said mary it's important that people see this and um so that's that's how that happened it was it was the things that we witness in our careers are so you just can't believe it sometimes the things we see and hear and um I was really, really glad to get their story out. And, and I will always be forever grateful to these veterans who opened up their lives. I know I've said that before, but it's, it's kind of, you know, it's sort of this, it, it's the mantra, I suppose, you know, because it's all about them. You can, it, it's never about the photographer. You know, it's all about their story. And that's one of the things that I think is a cornerstone of photojournalism is that it's not about us. It's about the people we photograph and the issues we photograph. And it's our job to show the human toll behind this kind of trauma. And um, so, yeah, when, when I'm making these pictures, when I'm doing these projects, that, that's in the back of my head all the time. and. Um, you know, I, n I never thought that this work would become my life's work, but it, it looks like it has. And, and that's okay. And, you know, when I started this project, I thought I could bring about meaningful social change. And, um, of course, you know, the root awakening is that meaningful social change happens very, very slowly. And so, you know, you look at things like, like gay marriage that went all the way to the Supreme Court, and that didn't happen because one photographer made pictures, it happened because of a groundswell of, of the public coming together and journalists coming together and, and people starting to understand the issue and why it was important, why it is important. And so to me, that, that's the power of photography. And, um, you know, that, that I can say that I'm part of the groundswell that someday hopefully will lead to um, a change in this kind of culture where these kind of crimes occur. Beautifully stated. And uh, I'm going to unshare. So we are back to full screen. Sometimes I do these interviews and it's really hard to breathe afterwards. Um, this is one of those moments. It's a very, very serious story to tell. It certainly, uh, shows your passion for this. And I guess the story will continue on. Um, it's not over. And uh, we're seeing this a lot in the world today. So it plays right into everything right now and the importance. And again, this is no secret to me because I've known you for decades. Um, and uh, I know Joe and, and, and certainly for you to give us your time today, we are very thankful um, and, and appreciate it. Well, I'm, I'm honored to be part of, the, of this series. And um it's, it's always great to see you and, and to, to, to be with you in this virtual world. So, and I'm, I'm really glad to see this series and how you're featuring so many different types of photography. And because it's photography is, you know, it's a very kind of specific discipline at its, its core, but it's, it's a language that is kind of universal. And, um, as as our good friend Chip Mori says, everybody speaks it with a different accent, and and that's just beautiful. So oh my God, you say Chip, and it reminds me of everybody that uh -huh. used to come to the workshop, Eli Reed, and so many other photographers that gave up a lot of their time to do that, and as you did. So thank you for that. Those of you tuning in, another epic hour with an epic photographer, Mary Calvert. Mary F. Calvert is her Instagram page, uh, her website. So go to her website to see the great work uh, and, um, and some of the, the great things she's done throughout her career. Check out NikonUSA.com backslash the creator's hour for more of these interviews. Again, by the time we're done, we will have done 50 interviews during the creator's hour with really, really great photographers, different disciplines. And we hope you're inspired to tell your stories. So everybody out there, get out there, take pictures, share them with us, share them with the world. Thank you for tuning in. And for Nikon, I'm Mike Corrado. Everybody out there, be safe. We'll see you soon.